नमस्कार एवरीवन वेलकम टू माय यूट्यूब चैनल नाउ दिस इज द वेरी फर्स्ट वीडियो दैट आई एम रिकॉर्डिंग फॉर यूट्यूब एंड आल्सो माय वेरी फर्स्ट पॉडकास्ट इन एनी कैपेसिटी सो आई रिक्वेस्ट यू ऑल टू बी अ लिटिल काइंड इन द कमेंट सेक्शन एंड बिफोर वी बिगिन आई वॉन्टेड टू थैंक गौरांग फ्रॉम द मूड कोट एसोसिएशन ऑफ गवर्नमेंट लॉ कॉलेज एज वेल एज अदर स्टूडेंट्स and my own friends who have been pushing me to start my own youtube channel for quite some time so here i am now some of you may be wondering what the purpose of this podcast is it's very simple it aims to inspire our budding lawyers to strive for excellence and be more socially aware and responsible citizens and today it is my absolute delight and privilege to have ribero sir with us sir needs no introduction he is a legend he is the super cop he is the outlaw who continues to motivate and inspire everyone around him uh, through his words and actions uh, welcome to the podcast sir thank you thank you shiva glad to be the thank first you. on your podcast <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> thank you sir thank you um you know let's start with uh, government law college since that's one common link uh between us uh so you graduated in the year 1950 if i'm not wrong and yes. i just wanted to <laughs> ask you what was it like to be a law student in those days and what are some of your memories from law school well you know i had a lot of made very good friends and some of them were brilliant young people you know fali nariman was my uh, classmate and we had professors like uh, justice chandrachud his son is now sitting on the supreme court bench and uh, he was his father was my teacher he later became the chief justice of india um Mr. Palki Mala is my teacher. He, he was he used to. He was a guest. These were guest teachers. The the teachers who were there permanently were Principal Tope, who became T.K. Tope, who later became the principal of the college. He used to teach us constitutional law, and uh, I think there were just one or two permanent teachers. The principal was Principal Chitale, and. Uh, mainly the teachers used to come from the uh, bar and from from the judiciary justice vimadalal was another teacher of mine i you know the fact that they were my teachers chandrachud and uh, uh, vimadalal i remember when i was the sp the superintendent of police of pune and they used to uh, visit pune quite regularly and every time they arrived by deccan queen they would first enter my office <laughs> they would that would be the first stop to to meet that old student and they would say we want to meet our old student by that time and uh, so everybody was very impressed that uh, they used to read about so much that they used to come to meet me and they they would come in for about 15 minutes have a chat and then uh, depart it was so uh, so you know something that you always remember i still fond of you <laughs> that was one of the thing that i remember yeah so you mentioned about uh, late dr tope in fact you came to glc after many years in 2015 uh when you presided over uran followed by two editions of the late uh, dr tk tope memorial lecture uh so what was your equation with uh, professor tope like and was he the principal of glc when you were there i think he no. must have been a professor he was he used to teach us constitutional law he used to teach us dicey you know dicey's constitutional law and uh, Chitale was the principal of government law. I remember that when I results came out of the of the final law exam, and the two of them, 
but other amazed that I that I had done so well. You know, I think I came ninth in the in the university, and uh, uh, our Nariman gave had come third. Fali Fali had come third, and I had a very good friend of mine who was a brilliant man. I thought he was more brilliant than Fali. Um, is uh, and Kamtekar is Dilip Shankar Rao Kamtekar, and I thought he was really brilliant, and uh, he stood first or second in the IAS exam in one year before I appeared, and he was uh, allotted to the Indian Foreign Service, and he went and he spent his life as a diplomat, but I I, I was amazed that I beat him also by a couple couple of marks. <laughs> In the final exam, and so these two professors, Chitale and Tope, they were amazed, and they kept looking at me, and, and they said, perhaps it was because of his of his command over the English language. <laughs> they didn't think that I was so good in law <laughs> as the English language. I remember that very well. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Another um, thing I, I remember about Tope was that yes, he sir. married a little late. And uh, he uh, brought his uh, new wife to introduce to us students. Or, or we had we used to have some gatherings on the terrace of the law college, and we had that gathering. And he brought her, and I remember he introduced us like this. Like this, uh, he said, "Tope, this is Ribeiro. Ribeiro, this is Tope." <laughs> I, I remember that. So I found it very uh, amusing. But then I, you know. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, now, a lot of law students uh, also aspire for UPSC. And yeah. um, so this question is specifically for them. Uh, yeah. So what motivated you to join the police service specifically? Well, it was not the police service that I wanted to join. I was interested in the civil services. And my father also belonged to the civil services. He was a direct recruit to the postal service. And my mother used to always, my father died when I was eight years old. So my mother and my grandmother, that is my father's mother, they're two women who brought, brought me up. And of course my siblings. And they were always interested that I should uh, follow my father into the civil service. Now the civil service means there were this host of services, the principal being the IAS and the foreign service. And, uh, you know, in those days when I appeared in 1952, uh, there were, uh, you had to do two extra papers to, to qualify for the IAS. Uh, now, none of those subjects were in my ken because I had studied commerce and law and uh, there were, if you had studied science or if you had studied uh, arts, particularly arts, the liberal arts, then you had a host of, of uh, choices. And uh, I thought that if I had studied history or literature, which, which I really took to after I joined service and not before, uh, I think I would have done much better, even appeared for the, competed for the IAS. But I competed only for the central services and the police service. It's uh, interesting about the police service that you had to, they only counted two papers and I had uh, given advanced accounts and auditing and uh, law as the other. And for the third, third paper, which was for the central, I was happy, I would have been happy if I had got into the postal service with my father uh, also serve and uh, so that uh, I gave I gave commercial law you know that was a, another paper so as I did three optional papers law commercial law and uh, uh, audit and accounts so in the law in the first time I appeared I got seven, 71 percent in that exam and I was very happy about that uh, and then uh, uh, I didn't get through the Viva Voce part of it because you had to score a certain amount of marks. So uh, I had to appear again and got those marks and then I uh, uh, was selected. 
Now there was another rule at the time I joined that if you score well enough after the IAS and the I, after the IAS and the foreign service, then you would have to go to the police service. Yeah, that was the rule under which I joined the police service. My mother was not very happy about <laughs> the police service because you know the, these ladies they, they were not exposed to the world as such, and they thought that. What is this? And you know, police, nobody liked, as you know. So they, they thought it. But, you know, after I joined, I mean, when I was selected, I was never unhappy. I thought it suited my temperament because by nature, I'm a social worker. And I think if a police or policeman behaves and uh, works, does his job as a social worker, helping others, I think uh, he, will, he will really succeed in his profession. And I thought that uh, that was exactly meant for me because I met so many people, so many people came to me, poor people, and particularly the poor people. Where would they go? I mean, where do they go with their problems? And if you try and solve them, I think they, they never forget it, never forget it. Even today, people who sometimes meet me, they said, you did this for me, you did that for me. And I don't remember because I did it because I thought it was my job to do it. And I felt good about it. So it, uh, it suited me. It was cut out for me, you know, the job. But I never intended to join the police service. It was just about because of my rank in the, in the, in the overall uh, list. Yeah. And so, so destiny had its own course for you. And yeah. uh, you've had such a legendary career. You have held so many important positions. Uh, when you look back today, what are some of the biggest learnings, you know, that you've had? Maybe just one or two of them that you'd be able to share right now with our audience. I think the most important one that I always sell these young entrants to the IPS. I go every year and talk to them. Now, of course, I can't, but before, incidentally, even though I can't go now, they, they did it on this format. They made me address the students on this format. And I give them some pearls of wisdom, you can call them. I say that, look, one was, as I told you, that you've got to be a good social worker, work for others. If you can, if you're always bothered about others and working for others. And the main important thing is that you should remember it is a service. It is not a force, it is a service. And service means you serve. And when you serve, you are a servant and you're a servant of the people. That is what is most important. Any government official, he thinks he's the son-in-law of the government. Actually, he should know that he is a servant of the people. And then when they come to him, he has to, uh, to tackle all those problems in that spirit. Now, there are people who come to you with um, requests that are, you cannot, uh, you know, they might be, may not be very legal or it might be not right or they may not be correct. Or they may be, it may be a civil matter which you are not uh, entitled to, to uh, decide. Well, to explain to them that you, it is outside your, your uh, jurisdiction is a little difficult, but you have to do it. And I think mostly I've succeeded. I even tell them what they should do as in, in, in order to make them feel that I'm not trying to avoid my responsibility. So that is the overall uh, approach to the job of policing. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, sir. I think that sums it up. Uh, very well. Uh, my next question is about uh, communal harmony because you have done substantial work towards ensuring communal harmony both during your service and post-retirement. Uh, we see that there are a lot of instances, you know, in the country uh, which are happening today. The very nature of communalism has in fact changed over the years and uh, the youth especially, you know, getting affected by this. Do you agree with this, sir, that the nature of communalism has changed over the years? And if at all there is something that the youth could do to ensure 
that communal harmony is maintained not just as a basic constitutional ethos but you know in the society at large you see there are, i have my views which i have formulated as the years go by in the beginning i had not thought about it in this light but say for example about religion now everybody follows different religion in which they are born but then i realized that religion was not there when human beings first came on this earth religions came much later and they came because when societies were formed when tribes you know when they started that they began thinking among themselves how how is it how did we come into this world where will we go after um, we are dead and whether there is any life beyond it so these are the things that you should worry them and then different uh, explanations were given so religions are basically explanations for the unknown and in different parts of the universe different religions came up each one giving their own explanation but actually nobody really knows but and but religions are good in the sense that it teaches you the what is right if you go through all the religions comparative religion you will find that the teachings are the same nobody tells you that you should go around killing others nobody tells you that you should go around stealing and or that you should go around fornicating i mean these are things that uh, are every religion teaches you but nobody bothers about those core values of religion they bother about it from a political angle that we belong to this and you get very proud about it and then you want to say that i am from this religion and that this is the best in the world i mean nobody knows who you can think it is the best but not that it is the only true explanation for the unknown no so that is one aspect number 2 i i know that if people are divided people of a country are divided on the base any basis religion or caste or or on uh, language or on culture or on food habits different thing that there is going to be trouble if there is no unity you will not face uh, any enemy number one external enemy and you will not be able to face internal enemies in the way that you should do in order to succeed in order to be a, uh, have an iota of peace or a modicum of peace so i have uh, i think that it is very important to get people together now when i was in romania as ambassador for four years i read up, i was there from 89 uh to 90 94 93 and 89 december to 93 december and i and i read about the riots in my own you know i was born in bombay those days it was bombay and then uh, uh, my grand my grandmother too was born here my father was born here i mean we have been we have settled here for more than 200 years in mumbai so we consider it our city so we come from goa which is a little more south uh, on the coast and uh, uh, my ancestors were all from from that we were hindus our ancestors and 450 years ago up to 450 to 400 years ago our ancestors were converted yeah uh, and uh, that is uh, uh, that is how uh, we uh, we have come here and, uh, in bombay in order to my great grandfather came he wanted to set up a business and he did that and uh, they educate my grandfather was the first in our community to do his ma because the college first college was set up is wilson college in mumbai i don't know whether you know that and that he went to that college and he got his ma from there my father also followed him and did his ma and he was a fellow of the wilson college at the same time as, as moraji bai was also a fellow mr uh, moraji bai desai and they were both fellows together in the same year <laughs> moraji bai told me that because i wouldn't know my father having died when i was eight so that is uh, bombay so i read about the riots in mumbai and i was surprised that the city of my, my city should behave in such a um, you know unfortunate manner and when i came back i said i will work on that and i decided to work on communal harmony in my city and that is the first 
uh, uh, jo first thing I did when I came back, I got in touch with people and I was very fortunate of, for two things. One is that there was a lady called uh, Sushobha Badwe, a Brahmin a Hindu lady who had actually spent, I read about her in the papers in, in when I was in, in Romania. The papers that were sent to me used to be sent in our in our uh, diplomatic bag every week. Once a week, we used to get them. So the week's papers used to come. And I read about her that she actually went and stayed in Muslim huts because it was the hutment areas, the slum areas that were affected. And, uh, and she tried to get them together and, and she did a lot of work on that. So we used, so I, I got in touch with her. She belonged to the MRA, the Moral Rearmament of Dr. Anand. And so in that same place where Dr. Anand later went to stay, I met her for the first time there. And we decided to go and meet the police commissioner because we required the police commissioner, the police on, on, on the table because uh, without them, we could not succeed. The people had to be, the people at the slum level, they should know that the police are with us. But they always felt the police was um, inimical to their interests, particularly the Muslims. They had lost all hope. So we, uh, we had mammoth meetings with them and got them together. It's a different story. It will take a long time. But we did it. And that is how we started the Mohalla Committee movement. And we, uh, I think it succeeded because during the 2002 Gujarat, uh, riots in uh, Godra riots uh, in Ahmedabad and other parts of Gujarat. There was a lot of tension here also in the in our uh, slum areas. So we went there. We went to Dharavi and we had a meeting where only the ladies were there because we had it at two o'clock or three o'clock in the afternoon when the men are at work. So the women, the Hindu women and the Muslim women, all in their traditional clothes. They came and held hands, one Muslim, one Hindu, one Muslim, one Hindu, and said they, they will ensure that their men do not go out and fight. Because they had suffered a lot during the 92-93 riots. They had participated, they had killed and they had got killed. They had, they had burnt and they got their, uh, their huts also were burnt. So there was, uh, they lost. And the people who instigated them, <laughs> They, are, they did not, they neither kill nor did they get killed. And we pointed that out to them and they understood it. And they said, we will not allow our men to fight. And then we use that same principle in other slums. Because we have covered almost all the slums that went to war or battle during the 92, 93 riots. And I think we did succeed in, in uh, getting a core in every place who, uh, both Hindus and Muslims who, uh, and the way we did it was to get them in touch with the police inspector. The police, because the top man, the, the commissioner was involved, he, and he used to come and address them. So then we, uh, the police officers also fell in line. And they, they relied on these people. Because the, one thing we did was to ensure that they had no other, uh, they had no other uh, you know, agendas on there to join this movement, except that they wanted peace in their areas. And once the police understood that, that they would not interfere in their police work, then uh, they, they, they were quite happy with our uh, contribution to the peace of this city. That is how we used to organize the movement. I've now handed it, I mean, I used to be for the years, I used to go to the slum areas even my wife used to accompany me because we had to go at, at, in the evening time when the men returned from work. And that used to be quite difficult to, to, you know, to traverse those slum areas at that time. But we could do it because we were younger. Younger means uh, we was, we, I was still in my 70s. But now at 90, it's not possible to, to do all that. And the younger people have taken over. And there's one Mr. K.L. Prasad was the uh, commissioner of police of Navi Bombay. He is now the chairman of the Mohalla Community Movement. Yeah. Thank you, sir. And this is such a good example of 
positive public police relations uh and one issue in fact that you have been very vocal about of late has been the politicization of police force and the police encounters uh in 2014 there was a judgment of the supreme court pucl versus state of maharashtra when they came up with guidelines for investigating police encounters but very interestingly the supreme court <laughs> labeled these encounters as state sponsored terrorism uh and despite that we saw what happened in hyderabad the encounter in kanpur and so on and so forth we continue to see these encounters how important do you think sir is the public perception about these encounter specialists in all of this and are politicians able to take that to their advantage you know i was a base when the bjp home minister in maharashtra it was the shiv sena bjp government narayan rane i think was the first manoj joshi and then narayan rane was the uh, chief minister from the shiv sena and the home minister was mr gopinath munde and gopinath munde in in the assembly mind you in the assembly he made a statement saying that i have instructed the police to shoot them <laughs> so i was surprised that i said how is this man is saying it so openly of course he is he is um, uh, he's, uh, has got the privilege uh, you know of talking like that in the assembly but uh, these things are are publicized and how do you get that kind of uh, of give them permission to do it now the 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 problem is that we uh, the criminals operate because we have been lax why have we, we been lax as soon as the criminal becomes a little more important he gets money and he gets muscle and this muscle and money is used during elections i remember one um, one home minister here in maharashtra when i was the commissioner he called my dcp to his house on a sunday with a file with a file of a, of a very big criminal and i uh, from dagri chaul you know that dagri chaul is a very and i and uh, the the dcp came to me and said sir i have been called with this file and i said he never told me the minister never told me i'll come with you and i went with him when he saw me the minister got rather taken aback and he said mr rivero i have not called you i said sir you cannot call my dcp without telling me especially if you are calling him for a thing like this for discussing the the detention of a of a of a criminal and then he had the cheek to tell me that that man is going to help them in the municipal elections so i had to tell him also i also had the cheek to tell him sir the police is not here for helping in election that is the job of the politician and it is my job to see that there is that uh, the elections are free and fair and that there is nobody who uses muscle and power and you want him to use obviously this man uses a lot of muscle so he is inside so we have detained him and sir uh, we are uh, we cannot do it we will not release him and if you are got if you have the powers you do it yourself but not not the police so that was the uh, later on that same minister became the chief minister and let me tell you something very very interesting it was vilas rao deshmukh and the, the then commissioner called all the old retired commissioners to meet him and they had all the big all the policemen were there and there was a public kind you know in public means a police meeting in the police uh, a compound of the of the commissioner's office if you have seen that commissioner's office it's a quite a, a impressive place and then there were these policemen sitting and and uh, i was on one side of the chief minister and on the other side was mr medical who was senior to me he was just we were the two senior most people so we got job and then the minister the chief minister when his time came he he addressed the policemen and he only spoke half the time about me and he said here is this man sitting here 
He never listened to me. <laughs> he never did what I told him. But now I realize the, the wisdom, his wisdom. And I, in, I would him uh, of, of not doing what I asked. And, and most of them were requests for transfer. And you all are the people who used to come and ask me for those transfers. Don't come again. <laughs> this is what he told them. You see, so it's a... Uh, uh, they understand because you see the, the the authority over of the police chiefs it goes out of their hands that is how politicization takes place it goes into the hands of the politician and then crime gets politicized because they they encourage these criminals who are going to help them with money and with muscle more than money so it's a it's a very dangerous proposition you know, there is a clear distinction, you must understand that, between uh, the terrorist-affected areas in this. Because terrorist-affected areas, we had never experienced before Punjab. Because there, the, the, the terrorists don't uh, bribe you. Like the, like the criminals here, the underworld gangs, the big gangs, they bribe. They bribe the police, they bribe the politicians, that is how they operate. And that is why the scale of operations also increases. Whereas the terrorists don't do that, they just put a bullet to you. As soon as they see that you are a policeman or even if you are in plain clothes that they recognize you, they straight away shoot you. So they, have, they, they don't accept the state. They don't, they don't think the state is, is legitimate. Whereas here, they, they, they don't... Uh, say that the state is illeg illegitimate, but they say the state is corrupt and here's the money and they allow us to operate. Now, if you as a policeman and a police officer don't allow the, them to operate, then there is much better policing. You understand Then there are most of most uh, commissioners who came were straightforward people and they didn't allow it or at least they, they were not in it. And that is how things could be kept in check. Whenever there were uh, commissioners who were, who were interested in becoming rich themselves, then you had a problem. And that is how uh, politicization, criminalization of politics, all that is due to corruption. I could give you a long explanation yeah. about it. Yeah. This is a short explanation. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, sir. That was a very enlightening <laughs> explanation. And I've just come to the last question uh, for this podcast, which is, uh, we have all been experiencing this pandemic and the new normal, which has sort of pushed us to meet also, you know, this way. So how have you been coping up so, uh, with the pandemic? And if there's anything new that you have read or learned that, that you'd like to share with our audience, please. See, um... It is a total uh, break, break from our normal existence. I used to go every day to the office, to the PCGT, and spend my morning there. In the afternoons, I did not go. But the mornings were all spent there. I don't do that anymore. I've not even stepped into the office. And I don't intend to step into it again. So this is the, the, the effect of the COVID. Besides COVID, in my case, there's also age, because I'm almost, in, I'm just one month short of 92. I was born in 29 mm -hmm. May, so so it just so it's the age also is catching on. There are the national nat, natural ravages of age, but besides the fact that there was COVID, now we stayed indoors, my wife and I, we stayed indoors, and unfortunately. In, in 2019, I broke my the neck of the femur, my leg. I broke my leg and that also was a big drawback, setback rather, for me. My wife broke it. One year later, she broke her leg. So we are both um, uh, sort of um, a little, one, one, leg, one leg short, you may say. And so it's difficult for us. It's better for us to stay home. So the, in that way, the COVID has also come to our relief because now nobody expects us to come out. And even the government says people above 65, are, we, are, we are now much beyond that. So we don't go out. And, we are, and so we have saved ourselves from COVID basically by 
keeping away from crowds, even from our own families. When they come, they keep the distance. Yeah. So that's it, sir. Thank you so much for okay. uh, for being here. Uh, you have been an inspiration for me. Everyone. uh you know who knows you is inspired by you and i'm sure that this podcast is going to inspire uh many more people for years to come and uh, i apologize to you as well as the audience if i asked something which was inappropriate but this is also my first time doing anything like this uh so i hope that you wouldn't find and uh, yeah i uh, thank you so much sir thank you <laughs> thank you sure